don't know who this is, this, this is the Celebrate Recovery Praise and Worship Team. And every single time they get up on a Sunday night, they blow me away. They're so anointed. I want you to give praise to God for them. Hallelujah. They bring us into the presence of God. And they do a great work. They do a great work on Monday nights. Every Monday night, they're faithful to be here. As so many, I don't even know how many. We've had as many as 120 folks come out on Monday nights to be set free from addiction. And they're here. They're faithful. Many of them have gotten coins for six months and a year's worth of sobriety. And they've been working hard. The program here is an amazing program. And, you know, it's not just for addictions. You hear these things. But it's for what we call hurts, hang-ups, and habits. Hurts. If you got hurts in your life, hang-ups in your life are habits. You know, I once studied that and looked at it real close and I thought, wow, you know what? That's all of us. So maybe we should all be here Monday night. But I'm so proud of what they do and how they lead us in worship. And as they were singing tonight, I was reminded of when Jesus stepped in, as was his ritual, when he would step into the temple. He stepped in, Sister Peggy, and he was asked to read the parchment and he picked up the words of Isaiah. When he said these things, I, I thought of this group while you were singing. And, and I'm so proud of you. I want you to know that. Man, Tyler, you blew that out, that song tonight. You know, he, he's so quiet sometimes and you don't realize what's inside him. And Mary, a lot of folks don't know Mary very well. She's so quiet. She sits over in a corner somewhere, but get up there and man, the anointing will fall on her. And I'm sitting here weeping while she's singing. That's the Holy Spirit at work in someone's life. And I appreciate, I appreciate them. And I want them to know that they matter. Emma, you lead. You're a worship director. You're a worship, you're, you're a leader in worship. And I love that about you. You're so anointed and you have such passion and love. And the whole band, everybody together, all the way back to Jim Long up in the box up there. They do a great job. And one more time, thank Celebrate Recovery. But this is what Jesus, the story of what happened there and we're going to pray before brother marty comes to receive or to give us the word tonight and jesus came to nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was he went into the synagogue on the sabbath day and stood up for to read and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet isaiah when he had opened the book he found the place where it was written and he said these words the spirit of the lord is upon me. And I don't want you to just hear me read it. I want you to receive this word into your spirit. It's red letter. That means Jesus spoke it. And when he spoke it, he spoke. How many of you know he's, a, he's creative in his words? When he speaks, it's life. Amen. When he speaks, it, it, things change. You know, a, a man will speak and it might be a good speech. A, a man might give a good oratory or a good message. A man might give you words. They won't do a whole lot to change your life. They may bring a tear. It may, it may inspire you to, to stand up and join a cause. But only the words of Jesus Christ, only the words that he speaks can bring life and can bring change. And so these words in the scripture were not written by men. They were written by men, but they were God-breathed. That means every word that you read in this word, it, it ought not to ever be casual with you. It ought to be something that speaks to your spirit and allow the life of it. Now listen, Jesus himself, this is like a double whammy. This wasn't just God-breathed words. This was Jesus' words. And when we speak his words just now, I'm believing that as we read this tonight, people who've come in here that need a touch from God, you came on a Sunday night because you, you don't want to be anywhere else. You don't want to be out with the family cooking at a barbecue. You don't want to be sitting in the lounge chair with the remote control. You came tonight because you wanted to be in church. You wanted to encounter with God, and you're going to get that because the words of life, the words of life are going to speak into yours. 
And as they do, I want you to receive. If you need healing, if you need deliverance, if you need a touch from God, if you need that life to just well up inside you. Maybe you're going, let's, Gary, I haven't been able to forget what Gary said this morning when he said some of you have got hurricanes going on in your life. You got tornadoes. You got all kinds of freakish weather patterns. You got things going on that's trying to detour you. Everything stops when a hurricane comes. We just board up and move on. Many evacuate. Some have to go to refuge. People are, everything stops when a hurricane comes. Some of you might be going through a hurricane tonight, but guess what? You're going to walk out of here, and you're going to get the all clear sign. In the name of Jesus, you're going to get the all clear sign. Because as we read these words, I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to hear the words of life spoken by the Savior himself. When he read these words, he said this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty. I'm going to read it again. There's the line. To set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister, and he sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day, or this night, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. The great physician is here right now. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to lift up your hands to the Lord. I'm believing that a wind of the Holy Ghost is going to sweep through this house on a Sunday night. Right here, right now, we're just learning how to flow in the Spirit of God. This morning at the 9 o'clock service, we didn't follow one thing on the order. Everything was was thrown out the window because there was a, a move of the Holy Ghost. And He wants to move right now in your life. I can't set you free. My words won't change your circumstance. But the words of life, the words of Jesus tonight will touch you and transform your situation. Lifting those hands up to God, begin to call on the name of the one that is able, the one that brings life to you right now. I believe in chains are going to fall right now. I'm believing the, the prison doors are going to be open. You you say, I, I'm not in prison. Oh, you don't know the bondage the enemy tries to wrap us up with and the strongholds he tries to put over our lives and the way that he tries to ennum, en, ennumber us with, your, with the things of this world and the worries of this world. Lord, we just cast it all off right now. We cast it off in the name of Jesus. Believe you, Lord, for freedom. Believe you for liberty, Lord. We've been bruised. We've been battered. We've been beaten left and right. The world and this life and the enemy is trying so hard to suffocate us in the circumstances of this life. But, oh, God, we look to you now, the author and the finisher of our faith, and we call on the one who is able to set us free in Jesus' name. We receive life. We receive healing. We receive liberty. We receive, God, deliverance in the name of Jesus. Courage is coming to your heart. Courage is coming to your heart. Strength is coming to your heart and to your mind in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you and we honor you, Lord. We give you glory. Sing for me. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, sickness has to go in this house tonight. Sickness has to go. We claim our healing by the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that words of life have been spoken over us. The enemy thought he would drown us in our storm and in our circumstances, but we've been rescued tonight in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we worship you, Lord. 
in the name of Jesus. Now I want you to do something else. I want you to turn and find somebody else you can pray for right now. Would you look for a prayer partner right, right there by you? If you have to move over a pew, that's all right. Find somebody to agree with in prayer and pray with them right now. Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. challenge you with something. I want you to be on guard. The Bible says in Proverbs, it says, guard your heart. Say that with me. Say it one more time. Guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues, the issues of life. When we, when we look at the world around us and when we look at what's happening everywhere we are, we've got to keep our joy. Everybody say joy. We got to keep our peace. We got to keep our love for one another. I'm telling you, Audrey, we got to we got to be intentional at making sure we're edifying and building up one another. We don't allow the enemy to bring wedges and divide. Come on. I don't know why I'm doing this. I I'm just going with what I feel, Marty. You're coming in just a moment, but we need to remember that we are to guard those things. Somebody says, "Well, that's God's job." No, God told you to guard your heart. He wants us to guard, keep watch, stand in the tower, and look out for one another. I'm looking out for Pastor Brian. I'm looking out for Pastor Amelia. I'm looking out for them. I'm watching them. I've got their back. 
Every time they, if I see the enemy, if I feel in prayer that the enemy's trying to attack them, and I'm, I'm coming to the rescue. I'm going to hook up with them. I'm going to hook up with my brothers and my sisters all over this house. I'm not going to let the enemy let any divide or anything come to try to tear down the unity that gets the work done of God. You know, the only way any rescue operation can happen is if there is a complete order to the work and everybody's on the same page. Is that right? I want us to be committed, faithful to the work that, man, do you see the chaos that's happening out there? Do you understand? I mean, I didn't even talk to you about it. Many of you have talked about it, but we go from eclipse to hurricanes on all sides, earthquakes. I mean, do you realize the Bible tells us that these are the signs of the coming of the Lord? He said, when you see these things begin to come to pass, look up. Has anybody been glancing up lately? Look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. He said in his word, think it not strange, the fiery trial that's come against you. We got to get our mind right and guard our heart and realize, boy, the enemy is out to get us. He's out to get you because you belong to God, and he doesn't like God. So he wants to stop the work. But man, we are victorious. We already won the battle. It's already been done. We don't have to worry about it. We just have to stay in our armor. I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to preach on Ephesians chapter 6. You just go home and read it. You're supposed to put on every piece of that armor every morning when you wake up. The enemy cannot beat you down or me down if I've got my armor on. Y'all didn't give me enough time to preach this morning, so I guess you got two messages in one. My brother-in-law is coming. I love this man with all of my heart. He is a godly man. He's full of character and integrity. In our family, he is, he is a patriarch. And I love him with everything in me. He's close to my heart, and he's real close to my sister's heart. But I love him, and he's anointed to preach the gospel. And I know he's got a word not only for us, for you, he's got one for the, his pastor. Because I, I want to come to church tonight. Amen? Do you feel like the Lord has already done something? Now we're ready for the word? How many, how many of you know, I'll tell you what I felt in my spirit. I felt like we had to get our hearts and minds all in gear. We had to get ready. We got too many things on our minds. We've been geared and watching TV all day, watching this hurricane, and we're worried about loved ones, and we're not knowing what's going on in the world. We had to get our hearts and minds all on the same page so we can receive the word. I'm ready for it, aren't you? Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. doing tonight? Everybody doing good? Isn't it awesome to serve an on-time God? You know, you, uh, you go through struggles in this life, and I love it when we get confirmation of sometimes the struggles that we go through that maybe what we're dealing with is uh, something God's working out in us and through us, and it gets confirmed uh, when you come into the presence of the Lord and you hear the songs of worship that we experience tonight. Uh, the word that Pastor got up here and shared, which was in my notes tonight, um, all that, we could just go home right now and say we've had church, uh, Brother Russ, and, and be happy with it. But I believe the Lord has something for us tonight. I've, I've, I've struggled this week over this word and came down with a migraine last night, uh, had to stop studying, and had to just not watch the Ohio State game, which doesn't sound like I miss much. And... Um, but I tell you what, the Lord's good, and it's his word, and, and as long as it's more of him and less of me, we're all in better shape. But tonight, we're going to look at God's word. You know, something the Lord just spoke to me over here is, you know, what the enemy is trying to cause in your life. We look at these hurricanes. We look at the physical things that are happening. But what the enemy may be trying to cause in your life may be an ingredient that God is going to turn around and use for his good. And we're going to look at the anointing tonight. We're going to look at what it is to live an anointed life. I've, I've called or titled tonight's sermon, Living My Life with God's Anointing. Now, that doesn't happen by accident. 
That doesn't happen by coming in and out of church and trying to get my praise on for a few moments and then go on back to work and do what I do and then show up next Sunday. Doesn't work that way. If you're going to live an anointed life, if God's anointing is going to be upon you, then there's, there's some things we've got to do. You know, our culture, our world is upside down. And I believe that, that humanity is directly in the crosshairs of the enemy. The enemy, we see in the physical sense the storms that are going on, but I'm telling you, the enemy in these last days is trying his best to uh, defeat humanity as a whole, but especially those that are called, those that carry an anointing. Believe me, we have a target on our back. I know this is a Sunday night crowd, so I know who I'm talking to tonight. But understand this, that to carry the anointing of God in your life, it's like living a life with a target on your back. There are things you're going to have to go through, but understand that what may be meant for your harm by the enemy, God will turn it around for his good. <laughs> amen, amen. Some of the things I think we need to grasp before I get into our scripture tonight, and you can get it ready and I'll read it. It's going to be in Exodus uh, chapter 30. We're going to read verse 22 through 25. But before we get into that, I want us to understand that when we look at God's Word, we have to understand that this is not just a book. We have to understand that this is a body of revealed truth. That this, There are two things on this planet that are eternal, God's Word and the soul of humanity. Now, when there's a collision course on this side of heaven with God's Word and the soul of humanity, a decision has to be made, and it's an eternal decision. And what we have to understand is that we can't handle the holy things of God with unholy hands. You can't do that. And I look in his word and I see in Psalm 119 and 89, it says that forever, O oh Lord, thy word is, is settled in the heavens. So we can, we can look at God's word and understand that it is settled in the heavens, that it's already this eternal word of God that has been spoken here, we get benefit from, but it is also settled in the heavens. We can look at scriptures like Psalm 119 and 105. We see it's a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We can, we can look at other scriptures like Hebrews 4 and 12 where it talks about it being quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword that it pierces even to the dividing the center of my soul and my spirit, the joints of my marrow. It's a discerner of my thoughts, the intents of my heart. Now, you might not know why you do what you do, and believe me, there are times during my week, I question, my wife, I know questions, why I do some of the things I do. But I'm telling you, get in God's word, and you'll find out why you do the things you do. God's word is a revelation of truth. It reveals, it's a body of revelation. Mark 16 and 20, it was said this way, and it says, And they went forth, and they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. It's alive. When we carry it, things happen. Jeremiah 15 and 16, he said, Thy words were found, and I did eat them, and they were as to me joy and rejoicing of my heart. Psalm 119 and 162 said, said the, the psalmist wrote, he said, I rejoice at thy word like one that finds great spoil. It's like walking outside, and, and Angie preached yesterday or taught up at, the, up at the Columbus Zoo, and one of the things that she had, was she had a treasure chest. She was talking about to the students there, the, the young ladies, that everything they do is put into a treasure chest. And God remembers it. And inside that chest is, is grace, and it's there for you. And when we look at God's word, it's like coming up on a treasure chest. And what we see out of that is that there's this revelation of God's word that comes alive in us, and it speaks to us, and it gives us direction for our life. And with that said, we can stand for the reading of God's word because what we have to understand tonight as we stand is that there's nothing in this book that's by accident. There's nothing that is in here. And, and my former pastor had done a study on the anointing, and I'm going to share parts of that with us tonight, but I know that there is nothing in here. We have to understand that. Just like Joseph, who was, who was placed in Potiphar's house specifically for a moment, right? And then all of a sudden God's people were taken into bondage. Well, they came out through Moses' calling and his deliverance on the day that God said they would. It was prophesied and it happened exactly the way God said it would because this is a real revealed body of truth and it, there, there is complete truth in it. And so we've got to wrap our mind around that, that when we look at the scripture, there's something there that God wants us to see. And that's what we're going to pray for tonight. Here in Exodus 30, starting in verse 22 through 25, it says, Moreover, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take thou also unto thee principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon half so much, even 
250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels. And after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of oil, olive, and hen, and thou shalt make it an oil of holy anointment, an ointment compound after the art of the apothecary, and it shall be a holy anointing oil. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray over your word tonight. I pray, God, that this would be the place that I decrease and you increase. I pray, God, the power of your word to be alive in us tonight. God, that it would get inside of us. And like spiritual surgery, God, it would discern our motives. It would discern our thoughts, God, the intents of our heart. God, let it get inside of us and turn the storm around that we're dealing with, God, that maybe the enemy is coming and attacking us with. God, I believe tonight what the enemy means for our harm, you determined to be turned around for our good, God. And I pray that tonight, Lord. I pray let your word come alive. Give us ears and give us a heart to understand stand and to receive tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We can be seated. So as, as we look at God's word, there's some things I want us to, before we pick this apart, I want us to wrap our mind around. In Psalm 133, 1 and 2, it says this, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of his garments. Now, we talked a little bit tonight about unity. I believe that a prerequisite tonight for us to be a carrier of God's anointing is that we've got to be unified with the body. And see, what happens is the day we live in, we live in a day that outside in the world, it's all about us. So it's difficult when we come into God's house, Gary, because all of a sudden we think it's all about us. And we get in here, it's upside down. See, it's not about us. It's not even about a group of us. It's all about him. Everything we do is about him. Everything we do shines light on him, gives glory to him, and that's what we have to understand. So when we look at God's house and the way God works, we understand that it's a kingdom. Now inside the flock, which is kind of what we are because Jesus ultimately is the head of the church, but inside here, Pastor Ray is the head that God has placed inside this church. So what we have to understand if we want to be a carrier of the anointing is, number one, we've got to take our rightful place under pastor. What, is he want, what has God called us to do, and where has he placed us in the body? Because if we want that precious oil to work its way down from our pasture and down into the place where we're serving, we've got to take our rightful place. And sometimes what happens is we get an idea, and I've seen it happen so many times, where somebody gets an idea, they'd rather do something someone else is doing, and they leave their place abandoned. Now, there's nobody there to do that, and they go off, and they try to think God's going to anoint them over here doing something completely different. And what we have to understand is that God works with unity. So we've got to be unified in the body. Now, another thing we can grab tonight is that the anointing is for this side of heaven. When you think about Elijah, Elijah was told by God to go find Elijah, throw his mantle on him, and anoint him to go and preach or prophesy to the next generation. So when we see that, we recognize that there was an anointing that was transferred. We also go to read that Elijah, when he was placed in a tomb, there was a dead man that they threw in on top of Elijah's bones. And when they threw that dead man in there, he came alive. The anointing was still present. The presence of God is what caused that dead man to come alive. So we understand that it's on this side of heaven that the anointing is beneficial. Isaiah prophesied, and this is where we talk a little bit about this being in our notes tonight. And I won't go all the way back through it, but it's where in Isaiah 61, and you see Jesus is repeating that in Luke 4 and 18. But at the very end of that, what we've got to understand is he goes through in verse 3 and it says, To appoint them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. We've got to understand tonight that the anointing that we carry in our life is not for us. It's not for us to get some type of acknowledgement, some type of accolade, some type of, some type of having our name put in print or anything like that. Anything that we carry in this life for God has got to be pointed back to him. We see it in Jesus. Jesus lived that life, everything he did. When he got up to fulfill this word, he came in on a Bible study of what would be considered God's people. He came in, he read that, like Pastor said, that word came alive. They thought, who in the world just came in there? He said, today, this is fulfilled in your ears. Why? Because he was a fulfillment of giving glory to God. See, now, they would have read that scripture, and it would have been all about them in that moment. But we have to understand tonight that everything we do is for the glory of God. Exodus 30 and 32 says it this way. It said, upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. 
neither shall you make anything like it after the composition of it. It is holy, and it shall be holy unto you. So we can't get up here and think we can do some song and dance, and then God's just going to anoint it and he's going to bless it because upon flesh, he's not going to pour that precious, precious oil. It's not about us. It's all about him. The anointing in itself, it speaks of an unction or the ability to have the Spirit of God to enable you to do what he's called you to do for him in a way that brings about eternal results. Now, I know that's a mouthful. But we're here to do, when you do things for God, we're talking about doing something that brings about an eternal result. And you can't do that apart from God's anointing. You cannot go out and try to to win the lost or try to help somebody that's in a broken condition without the anointing of God and think that it's going to bring about an eternal result. So we have to understand that it's the anointing that's going to make the difference in our life. With that as a backdrop, we're going to look at some of the ingredients tonight. It started off with myrrh. Myrrh itself is made from the gum resin of a low-growing, thorny myrrh tree. The word myrrh in itself, it means bitter. It smells sweet, but it's bitter to the taste. <laughs> Gary, to be, to be anointed, there are going to be times in our life we got to taste the bitter. <laughs> we got to taste the bitter. we got to choke on some things that maybe don't taste right. We got to deal with some things that maybe are difficult. We got to go through some things, and then on the back end of it, we've got to put out what would be the sweet to to those around us. And that's a difficult thing, but it's an ingredient that God placed in the anointing. I find it interesting that we come in and out of church and we sing and we pray and we talk about how we want to be like Jesus. I had the opportunity last Tuesday to stand up here and to have in our one of our encounter sessions with our youth. And I, we encounter the cross. <laughs> and I find it so ever, it just grabs me every time I do it, how we can live life as Christians. And we come in and out, and it's like we sing kumbaya, and we just want to get our praise on, and we want to try to find a place where maybe we can get some kind of acknowledgement or do something that, that maybe kind of eases that tension or eases that that thing in our life that we know God's calling us to something significant, but instead of giving ourselves to God, instead of giving him our life, we try to put a Band-Aid on things and we just try to pacify it. And we've got to realize something tonight, that myrrh is in the anointing. I mean, what did they do to Jesus? I mean, his own disciple was one that sold him out. One of his 12 that he'd chosen was the one that sold him out. They They came and they trumped up charges against him. They came at night and they took him and they illegally tried him. If you look at the history of that day, they couldn't even have those trials that they were having. It was outside of the law for that day, but they did it. They they beat him. They flogged him. He had another disciple that would go out and deny that he even knew him. And then they turned around and they crucified him and they sat down and they watched him die on a cross. Myrrh is going to be in the anointing oil. (laughs) When it gets difficult for you, you're going to have to live out Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, where it says, Wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside the weight and the sin that so easily besets us, and let us run our race with patience, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, and for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And it says, Consider him. Consider what he did for you. Consider the pain and the agony. Consider what he did lest you grow weary and faint. In your minds, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of it myself. I get difficult times come in my life and I want to I wanna, I wanna just faint. I just want to get weary. I just want to give in to the circumstances. Sometimes it's just easier. But the Bible tells us that we're to consider him, Chris, and what he went through. Because myrrh is in the anointing. And if you want to be anointed tonight to carry out what God's called you to do, you're going to have to do it. This is what it says in James 3.11. It says, does a fountain send forth the same place, sweet water and bitter? Acts 8 and 23 says, for I see, talking of Simon here, he says, for I see that you are full of bitterness. He said, and you are captive to sin. Hebrews 12 and 15 says, looking diligently, lest any man fall 
or fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, therefore by many be defiled. Now what that means, when you look up this word to, to looking at diligently, let's say when you follow that thing through, what you're going to grab tonight is that bitterness here is going to start off small. It starts off as a root, but it grows big. And if you allow it, believe me, I know what that feels like. I've been in situations where bitterness at a very young age began to overtake my life. And, and I'm telling you, you've got to be careful because I've come across some Christians that carry with them the bitterness of things that have happened in their life. And if you don't allow God to turn around what's happened against you from the enemy to turn it around for his good, I'm telling you, you'll never be able to live that life that he desires for you to be anointed in. That word diligently means to take the oversight. You have to be an overseer of your life. It's like having a garden. I love talking to Brother Van Hoos, wherever he's at tonight. We love to talk about his garden. I talked to him today about it, and I'm telling you, one thing I know about that is he knows how to tend a garden. If you want a good tomato, I don't want to put him out there. He might sell you one. Just talk to him. If not, he'll give you a secret on how to make it. But what I know is he is an overseer of that garden. It's like a garden that's grown within us. We have to be an overseer of our life. Pastor got up here, and he quoted Proverbs 4, 20 through 3, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Why do we have to keep that heart with all diligence? Because bitterness will take a root in you so quick that if you don't weed the garden, next thing you know, your life is full of weeds from the enemy. And why? Because it says here, springing up, they'll trouble you, and therefore by many be defiled. What that means is that you will communicate what's inside of you. You may try to share the presence of God with somebody, but that bitterness will overflow and it will take over the conversation. The next thing we've got to see is that cinnamon is the next thing that was in the anointing. Cinnamon means to stand upright. Cinnamon is a tall plant that has a flower on it that smells offensive. However, cinnamon itself is made from the bark of the plant. Now, when we look at that, what we got to understand is that when you stand upright for God, Ariel, when we stand upright for him, and we try to live right for him, and we try to do right for him when we go in and out of school and in and out of our families and try to do the right thing, that right standing, that purity, that holiness is offensive to the world. I'm telling you, people will be offended by the fact that you're trying to live right. They want to bring you down to where they are. But tonight, what you have to understand to carry an anointing in your life is that cinnamon is in the oil. (laughs) So we've got to understand that if we want to be anointed by God, we've got to allow his will to come alive in us. We've got to stand upright for him. Why? Because it says in his word that we're to be holy as he was holy. He gave us the example. You know, I thought about this, and I thought about how Important it is that we carry out this part of our life. God is a God of purity and uprightness. Right now, if you think about it, we sang tonight, we joined tonight, but think about this. Right now, they're singing around the throne, holy, holy, holy. What better way can we communicate that song in our own life by living an upright and holy life? See, what I don't understand is that when the great revival of our day happened back in the early 1900s, is it happened to a people that was trying to seek the face of God and try to do what God told them to do in his word. They didn't look for opinions. They didn't go to the world. They didn't try to look for any other way. But we live in a day because of our intellect, I think, that there's got to be a better way to do everything. We're always trying to invent something. I get with my brother-in-laws, and we just know we're going to invent the next best thing. We just know we can, and we're going to make all this money, and we're going to pay the church off. It's going to be great. That's the day we live in. Now, we can't bring that kind of thinking into God's house. Like I said, we cannot hold a holy truth with unholy hands and think that we're going to carry the anointing. God is the same today, yesterday, yesterday and forevermore. He has not changed. He is still holy. The angels are still worshiping him. He still demands purity in your life. He still demands holiness in our life. He demands us to stand upright and to be right and to live right and to do right. That is his way. It will always be his way. That is not going to change anytime soon. I can promise you that. Because cinnamon 
is in the oil. And if you want to live an anointed life, you've got to know something tonight that it's not a suggestion, it's not an option, it's not outdated, it's not a thing of the past, but it's for today. Next ingredient is calamus. Calamus is a reed, a sweet cane. And when you study these things out, they grow in the marsh places. We deal with them a lot. I've worked uh, on the highways for 18 years up here in Dayton, and we would have these places where cattails and things would begin to take over in wetlands. And what you got to understand is that, that when you look at calamus, it's a reed, a sweet cane. They grow in these marsh places. However, this particular one that God chose to put in this anointing oil, it grows in the miry clay. It doesn't just grow in the miry clay. It has adapted itself to thrive in the miry clay. (laughs) Not only that, but inside it, for it to be useful as a conduit, it has in its joints, it has places that have to be broken down. It has to be worn down. And when it does, it becomes useful for something to flow through it. So how do we apply that to to our life? We've got to look at this, and we've got to grab the truth of this tonight. We've got to realize that, number one, we've got to learn to thrive in miry places if we're going to be anointed by God. I immediately thought today of how I was reading in Jeremiah 29, 11. It's one of my favorite scriptures. I've got it on a coffee mug that a friend of mine had gave me at a pivotal point in my life, and it was a God moment. And I'm going to spare you of that tonight. I'm going to do what Angie says. I'm going to stick to the notes, Gary. Sticking to the notes. We're going to get out of here on time. But what I, I'll never forget it, Lawton. I was reading Je- chapters later in Jeremiah 29, 11. I thought about the plans because you know what? When we hear that scripture, Nathan, we love to hear that God's got plans for our life. I mean, I don't think I've ever shared that with somebody that was going through something that didn't think, man, that's great. I love to think that God's got a plan for this mess I'm dealing with, and he does. But what we have to understand is we grow in the Lord, and Jeremiah was growing in the Lord, and as he grew past God giving him that scripture, you get down a few chapters later, and they begin to tie cords and, and things together, and they lower Jeremiah down into a pit. The Bible said he began to sink in the mire. you got to learn to thrive in the miry places. Because if you're going to be used as a conduit for God, if you're going to be used in a way that God can do something effectively through your life, you've got to be willing to submit yourself to difficult times and difficult places in your life. How about Nehemiah? Nehemiah was one that God called to go and build a wall and rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And as soon as he got there, he he met opposition. The enemy sent a letter to him and tried to scare him off the wall and try to prevent him from doing things. How many times my sister-in-law Debbie's here tonight and we've shared stories where you get a thing in the mail and, and she's prayed with different people where they've gotten this attack and it comes to them, maybe it's through a, through a bill or anything, whatever it is, and, and she would pray with those people. And I've had situations where we've had to pray over things, right? And sometimes you get things and sometimes it's from the enemy and it's an attack. I'll never forget I was at Dayton and I was in a, in a vehicle accident and it was my fault. But it happened at work, and we have insurance at work. But I started getting those letters from the enemy. Had a tiger on the front of it. All of a sudden, now I'm in my 20s, and I'm scared. I got a wife, I got kids, I got a house, and I feel like now I'm about ready to lose everything through this accident. I'm being sued by this company. And come to find out, it all worked out, and God was there, and and it wasn't a big deal. But what we have to understand is that sometimes when we're trying to do God's work, we're going to deal with my replaces. Difficult places. We see here that Nehemiah, he got beyond that. He got to a point where he began to carry a sword. He began to fight with one hand. He kept a trowel in the other hand. It said he finished the work. I think it was like 52 days he was able to complete the work that God had called him to. He learned how to thrive in a a miry place. How about Paul? Paul was one that was a persecutor of Christians and finds himself in a place where he, on the road to Damascus, he's enlightened by the Spirit of God and who God is, and now he's called to be an apostle for Jesus in these last days, and he's, here he is, he begins to set out to do the work, and he runs directly into a miry place, it was called the church, (laughs) church didn't want anything to do with him, see he was a marked man coming in, and they thought, well he's not here for any good reason, so he's got to go. It was a miry place that Paul had to get over. He could have let the church hurt him. He could have let the church 
uh, annihilate, anna, anna, what do you want to call it, annihilate him or put him over in a corner and not let him do what he was called to do. And if you read his story, he goes off, and it's about three years he's out, and he's learning how to get through the miry places as God's working things out in his life. He comes back, and what, what happens to him? He finds himself shipwrecked. He finds himself beaten. He finds himself thrown in prison, and he learned through all those obstacles that he was in how to thrive in the, in the miry place. I'm reminded of the time when we talked about Ephesians 6 tonight as he's chained to a Roman guard. He's sizing up this guy that's guarding him as he's in prison, and he begins to correlate that with what the armor of God looks like in the Christian walk. He learned how to how to thrive in the miry place, and aren't we thankful that he did? Because now we have the armor of God, Scripture, and the letter he wrote to the church of Ephesus that helps us today. Next, we've got to go on to see that we have to allow the inner walls of our life to be broken down in order for God to pour the anointing through us and use us. Those inner walls, they speak of resistance. It could be insecurity. Ultimately, I think sometimes it could be our faith in ourself instead of God. And that could be a difficult place. Sometimes our insecurity or the way we view ourselves, or maybe it can just be the bitterness we talked about. It can be the obstacles in our life. There are things that, that Paul had to work out. And I've not met a Christian, and, and I'm telling you, man, God is still working on me. I am still a work in progress. But I'm telling you, if you're going to be used by God, you've got to allow him, like Hebrews 4 and 12, to allow his word to get inside of you, do spiritual surgery on you, and to begin to show you those things you need to change in your life. And you need to have courage to make those changes. You need to be an overseer of your own life. You need to weed the garden. You need to get the bitterness out. You need to get rid of the stuff. I've always said, and I've shared a lot on Wednesday nights, that I believe you got to live a life like Teflon. Don't let things stick to you. Because when it sticks to you, it becomes part of you. When it becomes part of you, people can see it. And I'm telling you, it's never pretty. So trust me tonight. We've got to realize tonight that we've got to allow those inner walls inside of us to be broken down so God can get us to a place where he can pour himself through us. If we look at ourselves and our ability, we will never step out to do anything for God. But if we get to the place that we allow God to do a work inside of us, where our inner walls are torn down, we can get to the place in our faith that we can see God's ability, and then it becomes all about him. It's got to be about him, church. We talked about Isaiah tonight. What's it look like? We sang about it, but do you ever really think about it? Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah gets to that place where he sees the Lord, and he's high, and he's lifted up. And his response to that is, woe is me. Isaiah is looking at himself. He recognizes that he's a man of woe. He recognizes that he has unclean lips. See, it's all about Isaiah at that moment. And he realizes that this can't happen. But then that coal, <laughs> the angel gets the coal and touches his lips, and all of a sudden it ain't about Isaiah anymore. All of a sudden now he goes from woe is me to send me. I'm ready to step up. See, what we have to understand tonight that if we're ever going to do anything for God, we got to get ourselves out of the way so that he can pour something through us because tonight we have to understand that calamus is in the anointing oil. we got to learn to thrive in the miry places. we got to learn to allow God to break down those inner walls inside of us. we got to get to the place like John 3 and 30 where it says, I must decrease and he must increase. It's got to be about him, not about us. Cassia is the next ingredient. It's a fragrant shrub with purple shriveled flowers. It has the appearance that it's bowing down. <laughs> Gary, you'd like that. It's a portrait of worship. If we're going to do anything for God, anything significant to carry the anointing, to 
help someone make an eternal decision in their life, if we're going to lead someone to the Lord, if we're going to do a ministry God's called us to, if we're going to sing on a praise team, if we're going to speak in a Sunday school class, if we're going to witness to somebody at work, if we're going to be a door greeter, if we're going to come back and, and help and celebrate recovery, if we're going to work in the coffee shop, if no matter what we do, we have to understand we've got to live a life of worship. It's got to be all about Him. It can't be anything about us. And what we see in this scripture, and when we look at Cassie and what it is, we see that it's a portrait of worship. I love it. Any achievement or accolade we get on this side of heaven should be given back to God in worship. I was looking today and I was praying over this, and if you look at the amount of the ingredients that's placed, like I said, at first reading, especially in the Old Testament, it could be tough, and I'm thankful to my former pastor for bringing some of this alive to me, but today I was reading some of this, and, and when I looked at this, I saw that if, if you look at the amount, you'll see that there's 500 shekels of myrrh, and there's 500 shekels of cassia. <laughs> oh, man. There's going to be times that you're going to have to taste the bitter. But I'm telling you that we have got to get to the place where we'll turn it around and it's worship. We can't let our bitterness squash our worship. And we can't get to the place where we think our worship discounts us from not ever having to taste the bitter. See, sometimes I think the church is on one end. We get to this place where we think we can worship. And as long as we're worshiping God, as long as we're in his house, as long as we're signed up to do something for God, that somehow we're going to be okay. And I think the other side, we get over here, and it's all about the bitter. And we taste the bitterness. And we taste the struggle. And we look at it from every angle. And the more we look at it, the harder it gets. And, and the more we think about it, the more bitter we get. And everything starts crowding in on us. And all we can see and all we can taste is the bitterness in our own soul and what we're dealing with. But where God desires us to be is right here in the middle, where somewhere the bitterness itself comes to this place and it begins to weigh out with the worship. <laughs> and then the worship comes, and it comes and meets this place, and it squashes out the bitterness. I'm telling you, there's a portrait of this when we look at Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas were on their way to worship God in his house. And when you look at that story as they're on their way to God, worship God in his house, they, they are met with a mob, and that mob ends up getting them thrown in prison. And there they find themselves in prison down in the inner dungeon. We went to study this on Wednesday night, and they're down at a place where they're shackled, and, and they're just done. You would just write them off. But somewhere in the midnight hour, they, they, they recognize that there was a worship inside their heart. Yes, they were in the presence and in the process of tasting the bitterness of their own soul. They were in a place of bitterness inside that prison. But somewhere in the midnight hour, they begin to worship. And when they begin to worship, we know the story. The shackles were loosed and the angel of the Lord come through and not only released them, but released everybody in the prison. And on their way out, there was this revival where now the jailer gets saved and, and the family gets saved, and it was this mighty move of God. I'm telling you tonight, what the enemy means for your harm, God is going to turn it around for your good if you will allow him to have your, his work in your life. Why? <laughs> because Cassia is in the anointing oil tonight. And if you're going to live a life that's anointed, you've got to live a life of worship. Last but not least, we look here and we see the olive oil. The oil was harvested around this time. It's a September, October harvest time for the oil. And what they do is they, they take a rod out and they shake trees and they shake the olives out of the trees. And when they get those olives down, then they begin to run a big steel roll, roll or a rock over top of them. And they just begin to crush the olives. And as they crush them, then they go and they scrape up the, the, the pulp and what's left, and then they, they do it again, and they squash it, and they roll it, and they extract. <laughs> they extract that oil that's, that's hidden inside the olive. What do we get out of that tonight? We've got to understand that for us to carry this anointing, that we've got to submit ourselves to some shakeups and some breakups in our life. There's going to be a shaking and a breaking that's going to take place. We see here how everything was shaken on this tree, and they would shake it, and it would bring the olives down to a place where it would have to fall down. To me, I look at that, and there's got to be a place where we're broken at the altar of God, that we come to a place where we pour ourselves out, and we allow him to 
break our will. We see Jesus' portrait of it in the Garden of Gethsemane. He cried and, and he prayed and he did it to the point of where his blood became like, his sweat became like great drops of blood. It's agony. And that's what it looks like sometimes for us. You've got to get to this place where you're broken. I remember it. I was in my senior year. And I had some bitterness that had ruled my life for a couple of years. And I come in and out of church and I did my best. But sometimes what happens is we look at the people that God has called or appointed to certain places. And because of the bitterness that sometimes we taste through the process, it can prevent us and stop us from being who God's called us to be. And I was in one of those places. And I remember sitting on the back pew of that church. And I remember that it had been years since I had felt that brokenness in my own heart. And I had just tried to carry. I, it was like in Hebrews 12, we talked about the weight. It's like I carried that weight. And I mean, it's difficult. And I'm, I'm here to tell somebody tonight, if you're carrying something, if you can remember what somebody said to you four or five years ago, you may have a problem with bitterness. If when you play it back, it brings those emotions and those feelings, and the next thing you know, you're spewing and regurgitating everything you feel, I'm telling you, you may be having and de dealing with bitterness in your own heart tonight, and that's kind of where I was at. I was at this place, and I remember telling God that if he would let me feel what Tim, a friend of mine, was crying like a baby at the end of the pew, <laughs> I said, I'll go down there. I think I shared this with Bob the other night. I don't think he's here tonight. And the body, and I tell you, the people that were there that night, they said I ran down to the altar. All I know, Pastor Brian, is I was broken before God. And he broke me wide open, and he did a work in me that night that, that he healed that. In fact, tonight I have, to, I have to really muster up some of the thoughts and the things that happened back then because he just healed that all over my life, and it's gone. And what we have to understand is that there will be times in our life that there will be a shaking. That shaking speaks of getting things in order in your life. See, what happens is we come into the church. I heard it said one time that I was on my church, on the way, my way to church to meet Jesus. And when I got there, I ran into serving. And I never met Jesus. And see, sometimes that's what's, what happens. We get things out of order. We, we, we don't allow things to get lined up in our life the way they should be. See, the first thing you are is a Christian. You live right. You talk right. You, you do right. Because we're a Christian. We represent the king. And so we got to have things in order. In order for us to, to live with the anointing in our life, we have to walk in, in order. And that's what that shaking speaks of. When you look at Ezekiel in the valley of dry bones, before he was able to resurrect that army of bones, what he did, and the Bible describes it as a shaking and a rattling begin to happen. And that's what happens. He was getting those bones in order. He was getting that structure put back the way that it should be. And that's what happens in our life is God's trying to work some things out. He's trying to get some things where it needs to be. I think about my wife who right now has two fingers taped together because she's broken one of them. And it didn't happen on my hard head as much as we like to think that way sometimes. But she was trying to get something. My grandson likes to put things under the couch. She was trying to get it out in the process. She broke one of her fingers and has them taped together. Why? Because the doctor's trying to get keep the bone in place. He's trying to keep things in order, the structure the way it should be, and that's what happens in our own life. We have to have our structure in order. Now, the breaking, it, it speaks of, of things in our own life. In Luke 20 and 17, it says, And beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? Jesus' words, The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. When you look at that, we talked about the coming of the Lord, it is soon. He is coming. <laughs> you know, we got a lot of people that want to say that, you know, we, the church has been saying that for a long time, I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff that's happened in the last hundred years, a lot of technology, a lot of things, the Bible said it would happen, it said in the last days men's knowledge would increase, we are in the day, the threshold for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to take his church out of this place. And if we're not careful, we can come in and out of God's house, Sister Liz, and he can desire to use us with the lost people around us that are dying and on their way to hell. And as he's desiring to use us and anoint us wherever he has planted us, if we're not careful, the own bitterness of our soul, the own struggles of our life can prevent us from being who God's designed us to be. But I'm here to tell you tonight that what the enemy meant for your harm, God's going to turn it around for your good. This scripture, it 
you think about how it says in Philippians 2 that every knee shall bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to what? Again, the glory of the Father. Everything we do is to the glory of the Father. And when we look at this scripture, we've got to understand something. We can be broken on this side of heaven, but we're going to be crushed with those that didn't choose right. And Pastor, I'm going to ask you to come on up tonight. But here we are tonight. For some of us, we need to fall on Jesus to allow him to break our own will possibly. Or for some of us, it may be the bitterness or some kind of inner struggle that is preventing us from fulfilling God's will in our life. Whatever that is, I encourage you tonight to know this, that where you are and what God has called you to is important. It's important. You know, Pastor Ray... He's an amazing man. He's my brother-in-law, but he's my pastor. He's my mentor. I think the world of him. And I tell you, I, I shared with him tonight about that migraine. He said, oh, don't worry. I'll go home. I'll study. I said, no, no, because you know what? I want to help him. And I want to do my part, whatever that is, and, and I want to play my part and do my part. And each one of you, Mary, it's important to see you up here singing tonight under the anointing of God. It's important, Emma, leading in worship. It's important that we do what God has called us to do, why we have time. Why we have this anointing, why we have the opportunity to utilize this anointing. Because when you look at Jesus' life, the anointing was to heal the broken. It was to save the lost. It was to, to heal the sick. It was to redeem those that are going the wrong direction. God desires to use you and wherever he's called you to. Amen. Would you stand tonight? If you would, while you're standing, just get out and come on down here to the altar. Those of you who can, if you're able to, I want you to work your way down towards this altar tonight. Amen. Amen. As you're coming into the altar, I want you to be prayerful. I believe tonight that this was a beautiful word for us. How many of you appreciate the word that we've heard this evening? Amen. Amen. The ingredients, the things that come together to make for the anointing in our life. I know that it, if you're doing right, if you have a good desire, come on, come on up here. In the, there's, the altar's up here empty. Come on up as close as you can. Get up in here in the altar. As a matter of fact, I want you to do something. I've been instructed twice by the Holy Spirit to do this. I want all the ladies to move over to this end right here, and I want all the guys to go over here. All ladies, come over here. All guys, go over here. You say, what in the world are you doing? Sometimes we just need one another. Can you get it? Can I get an amen out of this crowd? Guys, make it easy for the ladies to come through here. Come on, ladies. Amen. Don't let anybody stand by themselves. Just get over there next to somebody. talking about the ingredients, the, the qualifications, the things that we need in our lives to be anointed. How many of you want to be anointed by God? You don't want to just be somebody who gives speeches and talks to people or, or just serves out of a desire to be a volunteer, just a volunteer. You want to be someone who's anointed to do what you do. You can be anointed to, to work in the nursery. You can be anointed to, to clean God's house. You can be anointed to, to work in a camera or a sound system or to preach the gospel. You can be anointed to teach a class, whether it be to children or to adults. In everything that you and I do, no matter what it is, it ought to be that we do that under the anointing. I believe we need to have the anointing in our lives. I want the anointing. I don't want to just talk. I don't want to just get up here and give a good oratory or a good 
you know, sermon. I don't want just to do a sermon. I want, I want lives to be transformed and changed. I want us to come into God's house and leave here saying, wow, wasn't it good to be in God's house? And I'm thankful the way the Spirit moved this morning. I, I got texts and I got emails and I got phone calls. People saying, man, what a wonder. I could come in here tonight and three or four people grabbed me and said, man, wasn't it wonderful the way the Lord moved this morning? I'm so thankful for when the anointing is here because that's what makes the difference. The anointing is what makes the difference. And he's talking about the things of our lives that come together to make to create that anointing in us. Instead of seeing those things as hardships and things in our way, we need to see that God is placing them in our paths. I, I said this morning at the 9 o'clock service, I said it, it's important that we understand that, that sometimes when we're crying out for revival, when we're praying for an anointing, when we're praying for God to do something amazing in our lives or in the lives of the church, or, or we're even praying for, for the, the anointing or the, the Spirit of God to move mightily in our country, when we're praying for those things, we need to be ready for what comes with that. Because Marty, sometimes God sends a wind. He sends a rainstorm. Sometimes He sends a fire into our lives. Don't you stand back and think that fire in your life is not God. Don't think it's always just the enemy. Sometimes the, the Lord himself is allowing a, a wind, a strong current or a strong trial to come into your life because God is wanting to do something amazing in you. He wants to answer the cry of your own heart. How many of you would say in here, I want a personal revival. I want to be on fire for God. You know what that means? That means get your eyes off of everybody else. Get your eyes off of your brothers and your sisters and the church and the pastor. Get your eyes off of all of that. If you want a real revival and a real personal move of God in your life, then get your eyes off of other people. That's your first mistake. The second thing is get hungry and get thirsty and start looking to what God has put in your path because it's probably those very things that God is going to use to bring that revival into your life. If you will submit and surrender what God is doing in you now, where you are right now, then I'm believing God is going to empower you for a mighty move of God. And I'm believing in the name of Jesus. I'm believing right now for those who are starving for God to move in your life. For those who want to see a revival, not only in your life, but in this community and in this country, if you're really wanting to see it, I want you to shoot both hands up because you are right now a, 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 a move of God is waiting to happen inside your own heart. As you cry out to God, don't be afraid to cry out and lift up your voice to the Lord. I'd love to hear some folks crying out to God right now. I heard those people over on Miami Beach yesterday in that video and they weren't ashamed. They were crying out, Lord, we want to see your move. We want to see your hand, and we want to see it tonight. Lord, would you touch your people? Would you minister to your people? Would you move mightily right now in the name of Jesus? Lord, we're surrendered. We are completely given over. We want every ingredient. We want worship to meet our circumstance, and we want chains to fall from us. Lord, we don't want to fall for the devices and the entrapments the enemy has put in our path. We want to walk in victory. We want to walk in revival, and we thank you tonight. I believe the Spirit of God is breathing over this audience. I believe that there are men being filled with the Spirit right now, and ladies who are being filled with the Holy Ghost right now. You're going to not allow the enemy to put a stumbling block in your path. Not one more day. He is done. His plan, it loses starting right now. You rise up in courage, and you take a strong stance, and you be determined that you're walking out of here tonight on the water. You're walking out of here tonight over top of the storm and you're not going to let the enemy steal or kill or destroy in your life anymore. You receive life and peace and strength from God. Oh, I believe he's here to do that tonight. Now, I want you to drop your hands. Ladies, I want you to start praying for one another and not just one prayer partner. Get two or three there next to you and begin to pray for one another and look around. Don't let anybody pray by themselves, but find someone. Men, do the same. Look for brothers right next to you. You can lay hands on and you can pray with them and let God use you to pray for them tonight in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. 
Isn't 